sometimes when I teach, I teach about, you know, a verse that I really have some kind of chiddish around or something that a commentary that I really enjoy or something that I want to teach based off of that verse. Today's a little bit more drashi. Um, st it will still be a teaching and it'll still be interactive. But in terms of kind of how I got to this place, it's a little bit more um, as if I was writing my own midrash, less of like a, a practical, technical um, uh, takeaway that I want you to have. So with that very vague introduction, what, what I want us to talk about today is the fact that this week's Parsha and Parshat Chukat, we lose two people, both Aaron and Miriam die, which, you know, we have a very long Torah. So the, the fact that whoever decided to put the Torah together, the way that the Torah was put together in terms of the different parshiot, the fact that in one parsha we have both of these deaths is kind of interesting, right? You would think the two main characters, right? If you're writing a play or if you're writing a novel, you probably aren't going to have two main characters die in the same act or in the same chapter of a book. But we do have that. We have we have Miriam and Aaron die, and they di they die in very different ways. And the community has very different ways of approaching their death. And at the beginning of the parsha, before they die, we hear of this death ritual around the washing of a body, and how if you approach a body that has died, you yourself become. What, what what we say in English, which as you've all heard me say, I don't love as a translation, you become t you become impure, you become unfit for ritual closeness, right? You are you are unable to go to the temple to make sacrifices to have a close relationship with God. You are the opposite of tahor. You're the opposite of quote pure. Another translation I don't love. So, why do we get that? ritual and tradition at the beginning of this Parsha, and then we get these two deaths within the Parsha that, spoiler alert, don't talk about actually doing this ritual at all. We don't talk about this ritual of approaching a dead body or washing the body at all in terms of Miriam's death or Aaron's death. So why is it in the same Parsha? Why do we mention it in the first place? And why isn't it being used for Aaron and for Miriam? We're not going to get any of those answers today. <laughs> um, the rabbis, the, at least the commentaries and the and the different texts that I read in preparation for this class, had nothing to say on that question. Um, that doesn't mean that no one has anything to say on it. I just I didn't come across it while I was preparing this teaching. So I do have a few commentaries that we're going to look at, but I'm very curious to know what you think. And again, this is why this is going to be a little bit more drashi, a little bit more interpretive, um, and uh, and midrashic, so to speak for us today as opposed to intertextual. I wanna go through the, the, the uh, verses first, and then um, I'm happy to hear from people before we go to the commentaries, what you think of this general, this general premise of Suda Shlishi teaching. Okay, so Numbers 19, right? We're still in Parshat Chukat. Um, it says here, Kol hanogea bamet banefesh adam asher yamut, Velo it et et mishkan Adonai. So those who touch a corpse, right? Nogea means to touch or to uh, literally to grope, but to to any be be close to in terms of physical touch to a mate to a dead person. Um, Benefesh ha adam. It says here the body of a person who has died. I just got done telling Jackie that I usually change translations if I don't love them. I should have changed this. Benefesh ha adam means the soul of the person. Doesn't actually mean the body. So it's interesting that we go as far to say that you can't be near a mate, where which is basically them saying don't get near a dead body. But then they refer to the mate here as a nefesh, as a soul. So it's not only don't get near a dead body, but don't get near the soul of a body that is still in, in that flesh. Um, and do not purify themselves or and defy. So sorry, this is all in, I'm, I'm reading this out of order, which could be confusing. This is all in the negative, right? Anybody who touches a corpse, the, the soul of a person who has died and does not purify themselves, and then and therefore defiles God's tabernacle, those people shall be cut off from Israel. Venichreta hanefesh ha, hanefesh hahi. Karate, I'm definitely not going to get into this right now, but karate is a type of punishment that is not just lashes, is not just stoning, is not just what we would probably call um, uh, the word just went left on left my brain. Um, 
No, when you're like dismissed from excommunicated thank you so much it was on the tip of my tongue and then i got there and it went away um excommunication it's none of those things it's quite literally that you become dead to a community um i think i mentioned this a few weeks ago I, when you watch uh fiddler on the roof and uh tevia says to his daughter you're dead to me right that's karate right the community is not supposed to speak about her any longer it's as if she never existed so it's the highest punishment that you can receive and it's for the worst things that you can possibly do so that makes us believe that this type of ritual is extremely important Right, you shouldn't get near a dead body, and you should also make sure that if you do that, if you do the mitzvah of tahara, that you then don't come to the tabernacle because you wouldn't want to defile God's, God's tabernacle as a person who is tame, who is not ready for that kind of ritual closeness, or else you're going to get caught, right, or else you're going to be dead to the community, and also excommunicated. It's kind of a, a two-part process. Since the water of lustration, let me see if there's a, a better word to use here for that. Um, right? The, the water that's being used for this purification ritual was not dashed on them. They remain impure. So if you do not wash yourself in, in what we would call in the 21st century, a mikvah, or if you, don't, if you don't wash yourself in some kind of purifying way, you remain impure. And so you are you continue to be impure. This is where the Torah kind of repeats itself in a way that makes us know, no, really, you are. Right, you continue to be impure. Oh, do you think you're impure? Yes, you, you remain impure. So the takeaway from this very short sentence that I made very long was the fact that if you get near a dead body, you are impure. And therefore, and again, impure is not a great word, but you're not ready to be close to God. Therefore, if you get close to God, that's bad for you and you get this terrible punishment. The Torah goes on to say, this is the ritual. When a person dies in a tent, whoever enters the tent and whoever is in the tent shall be impure seven days. So do the ritual, make sure that you, that you, you know, take care of the dead body, but that then you also um, wash yourself with this meinida. Because if you've gotten near a dead person for seven days, you remain tame, you remain unable to approach God. Now, I've given a different sermon at a different time about the fact that it seems silly to me, a person who, those of you who know that I've done a lot of work with Hever Kadisha, this type of work is extremely holy. So it seems bizarre to me that you would actually be almost ostracized from a community for seven days for doing very holy work. It seems a little bit dissonant. Or you could see it the other way, which is you have, you have done something so elevated that now you need to give yourself a break, right? You need to give your soul some time to come down from that. Um, that's Rabbi Kligfeld's, you know, ice cream after a funeral sermon, right? You make sure that you can, you, you replenish yourself spiritually after dealing with something that is so heavy. So that's the first verse we're looking at. So that's the ritual, right? That's the water ritual that I was referring to before. Here, this next piece is chapter, chapter 20. So the next chapter, the first verse, the Israelites arrived in a body of the wilderness had seen on the first new moon, and the people stayed at Kadesh. That's not really so important for today. Miriam died there and was buried there. Okay, so Miriam died and she was buried. That's all we know. No one's talking about taking care of her body. No one's talking about this water ritual, just that she was buried and she died. Well, in the opposite. She, she wasn't buried first. She died and then she was buried, <laughs> which is better for her. Um, and then the next, the next verse says, the community was without water and they joined against Moshe and Aaron. So what would my question be based on the verses that we read before? Okay, why is that there? Yeah, Tybal? Does that mean that if you don't do the water, the, the requisite, the symmetrical punishment is being deprived of the water? I could not hear you very well, so say that one more time. That that it's um, a measured symmetrical punishment that if you don't do the ritual with the water, you don't get the water. I mean, oh, I know- Oh, interesting, okay. So so if you, great. So the, the fact that, that what Tybal just said, for those who, who couldn't hear, it was a little bit hard to hear in this room, um, that if you don't do the ritual with the water to make yourself pure after dealing with someone who has died, then you don't get water. Interesting. I saw it a very different way, which is how can they do the ritual with the water if the water went away, <laughs> right? If the water goes away after Miriam dies, now what water, 
right? How are you going to do this ritual? But Tybal's Tybal, uh, point is also well taken. But how are you going to do the ritual? There's no water. We were just told the water was taken away because Miriam died. Okay, then the third, ex the second, uh, the second example based off the second death example based off of this teaching is the same chapter, um, chapter 20, verse 25. Interesting, by the way, when I was setting this all up, I said that Miriam and Aaron died in the same Parsha, they die in the same chapter, right? So this, this is really, we are very, we are very, um, I don't know, invested in, in hearing about these two deaths. And unfortunately they happen in the same chapter at the beginning and at the end, but still. Take Aaron and his son Eleazar and bring them up on Mount Hor. Okay, so it's really, oh no, that's right, Hor, yeah. Um, so you are supposed to take Eleazar, Aaron's son, and you're, you're to go up to the mountain. Why might that happen? For those of us who don't know the rest of the story. Oh, okay, maybe the, the way he was gonna be sacrificed, that takes us back to Genesis. Yeah, exactly, to make sure to pass on the power before his father dies so that his father knows where the power is then going once he once he's no longer around. Strip Aaron of his, of his vestments and put them on his son Eleazar. There Aaron should be gathered until the, unto the dead. So basically he's saying as soon as you put your clothing of, um, I don't know, of... of valor on your son we now know it's like it's like the handing over of a gavel right we now know that he's in charge and then your you can die right you can um you can be gathered unto the dead as it says here in the torah so moses does this he strips aaron of his, of his vestments and puts them on on eleazar and aaron dies there on the summit of the mountain when moses and eleazar came down from the mountain the whole community knew that aaron had breathed his last all the house of israel bewailed aaron 30 days so there is ritual around aaron's death what is it great they bewailed him for 30 days we call that shloshim today nothing else right no tahara no water nothing just he died and they mourned him now Miriam and Aaron both die in ways that show us that the community cared for them right the water goes away so you miss Miriam uh we mourn Aaron for 30 days so we know that he was important to us but why start the Parsha off telling us about a death ritual to, to really care for those who are in your community, who you, who you care for, not to say that word too many times in one sentence. And yet, then when Aaron and Miriam die, we don't do it. Or maybe it's not mentioned, but it should be mentioned if we just learned how to do it, right? Okay, Tybal, try again. It's extremely hard to hear in this room, but try again. Um, the way you just said that, it made me wonder do we already know about a birth ritual when after a woman who gives birth, she has to separate herself from the community? Um, that's a good question. Has it already come up in the Torah? So Tybal's referring to when a woman gives birth for a boy, it's a certain amount of time and a girl, it's a certain amount of time. It's Tazria. Jackie knew that it was in Parsha Tazria. So yes, we already know of it. Yeah. Oh, because that that's a... matched. I was going to say that's matched birth and death. That Earth what? And death separation. That separation of what? It's matched birth and death. The same way you reframed it is you just did something very holy, so you need time to regroup. It's not like an ostracism. I was just saying that's just another match. Yeah, thing. yeah. Great, great, great. Yes, right. That is that is, correct. Exactly. Um, Jackie wants everybody to know that she that she knew that because it was her bat mitzvah parsha, but she's also a great student and she will be a great rabbi one day. Um, any questions on this or comments? So now you kind of see why I was interested in in these different pieces. Anybody have any any midrash on this or any commentaries you can give on this? Yeah. Oh yeah, so you must have read one of the commentaries, which is totally fine. Um, so Irv is just referring to the fact that 
in one of the commentaries that we may or may not get to, it talks about how, well, why, why did we mourn Aaron for 30 days? And for Moshe, it doesn't say anything about us mourning for him. And that's because Aaron was a Rodef Shalom. And so this idea that Aaron kind of went, uh, went above and beyond to make sure that people felt like he, oh no, Hev Shalom, we Rodef Shalom. Sorry, I didn't say the whole, the whole, his whole title. Um, the fact that he went kind of above and beyond to make sure that people felt like they were cared for and taken care of. And the Midrash says that, you know, when, when a man and wife were arguing and had some kind of issue, that he would bring them back together. And so the people really felt a sense of attachment to him because he was helping them stay as a community and attached. And the fact that it says that everybody mourned him for 30, for 30 days meant the rabbis love bringing this up meant that it wasn't just the men that mourned him, but it was also the women. And so that's why the Midrash um, brings up the women. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, no, great. That's great. That's wonderful. Yeah, Alan. Right. Right. Mm. Very interesting. That actually that actually gets to this last um, commentary that we're gonna read probably at the end. So that's a really yes. We'll we'll get there in just one second. Uh, Gary, go ahead. Oh, I'm glad to see that the source sheet went out because you have it printed. Great. <laughs> that's the Marlise does a great job with that stuff. Anyways, um, my question was: I, you can't expect for Aaron to be to be bathed in water. There's no water on the top of a mountain. You know, this is the summit of the mountain. So you're making assumptions that there's going to be water available and then nobody else was there. There's no, right. There was nobody else coming up except for the sun with him. Right. That, Gary makes a good point, right? We could assume that there probably wasn't so much water available to begin with and also that there was no one else around. So maybe the ritual couldn't be done because there was no one actually there when Aaron was um, taken onto the dead, as it says. We don't really know what that means, but but probably that he just... That he died, um, but that no one was around for his death. They had kind of prepared him for his death, but no one was actually there upon his death. Any other thoughts on this? Yeah, Tom. It's not really on that. So okay. I know. Yeah. 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 Ah. Uh, mm hmm. Did you raise my hand? Yeah. Muted? Well, not muted. Mm. <clears throat> great, great. So Tom just Tom just went back to this idea of both the use of nefesh as soul and also the idea of karate as being a cutting off of the soul, not just sending a person out from the, at that time, camp, but, but really a cutting off of the person as they, as they once were. And that maybe it has less to do with the actual ritual, the physical washing, the, the physical closeness to a body, but actually more that when we experience death, whether it's a person who we are close to or just communally know that there is a death, it does do something to your soul, right? It does something to the way that you care for another person. It does something to you if you've had experience with death that you are that then affected by and, and brought back to in terms of um, experiencing someone else's loss. So that all of that does get does get kind of brought uh, back to the surface, so to speak, in terms of it not being necessarily about the body, but about but about the soul. And it would be interesting to look into whether or not the rabbis thought, because it doesn't say this in the Torah anywhere, but whether or not the rabbis thought that Tahara was important. Because obviously back in the day, people 
died and it was a much messier experience than it typically is today. Um, and so tahara was both necessary hygienically and also ritually, but also were we were we dealing with a soul, right? Did we want to make sure that we were actually purifying a soul before it went um, before it went for burial as opposed to just the body? It's a really interesting point. Gary, is that a residual hand or is that a... Uh, Marlies. Oh, Marlies. Yes, speak loud, Marlies. Okay. I just had a question. If you're in the presence of someone who dies, are you considered to may or any type yes. of status change? Oh, you are. Yeah. So if you are, so I've told this story quite a few times. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sorry for repeating myself. When I first started here at Betham, mm -hmm. a teacher of mine and a congregant of ours died in their home. And I went and sat with the body for quite a few hours before anybody could come to, to pick them up. And I was then considered, I mean, I, we don't really have these, um, these standards, I should say, any longer. Could I have gone to a mikvah? I guess I could have. I'm now thinking about it years later, but I guess I could have. Um, but yes, technically I was then in a state of tuma, um, which for a whole host of other reasons, most of us are always in a state of tuma, but we don't have to get into that right now. Uh, but yeah, just by being around the dead body, even though I didn't touch them and I didn't, you know, I had nothing to do with the actual body itself. Yeah, good question. Thank you. So I want to read this last, this last, um, I don't even know that you can call it a midrash, this last piece of text, this last commentary here on the page. The others are, are commentaries that are very interesting, some of them more known to us than others, one from Rashi, one from Chizkuni, and then that um, midrash that Irv mentioned that I think many people know in terms of why Aaron was mourned for 30 days. But this was one I had never seen before. It's also from a book I've never heard of before. Um, but it's it's an interesting way of thinking about why why all this death kind of in one space and, and potentially why uh, the ritual was important to know of even going into this. Out of the three seminal protagonists who forged the Exodus, Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam, two died in the Book of Numbers, and all three died in the wilderness, right? This does not go as far as to say, and two mm -hmm. die in the same chapter, in the same Parsha, but that is also true. Moshe dies alone, buried in a valley overlooking a place of Israelite debauchery. Miriam's death catches us completely by surprise in the opening of Numbers 20 and merits only a clause in one verse. And the people stayed at Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried there. The community was without water and they joined against Moshe and Aaron. So if you've never read the Torah before, you come across this and you're like, wait a second, what? what how what what there are a lot of questions around why she died and how she died and why are we just hearing about her death and was there a lead up to her death? There is no recorded communal burial. It is as if the sands quickly covered her as the Israelites marched on, complaining insensitively about their unquenchable thirst to two fresh mourners. Interesting, when I read this, what I thought, well, let me ask you, what would you think of when, when reading this sentence about the sand covering her up? The covenant, Abraham. Okay, but but who's the other character in the Torah that gets covered up by sand after dying? Cor okay, Korach was not the one I was thinking of, but good, yes. The Egyptian who Moshe kills, right? Which is really interesting. I, I hadn't really... I didn't put those two things together, but as death became a looming reality, the grieving brothers barely picked up their heads at the loss. Miriam was one of many, an entire generation who disappeared into oblivion. Right, so this is going very you know, harsh into why don't we know more about Miriam's death and why don't we take care to know more about um, her passing. The text informs us of the fate of tribes who were poised to conquer the land. Um, I'm just going to skip a little since that's not our topic. Tens of thousands died in the Midbar, in the, in the wilderness, fulfilling God's prediction. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, I will do to you just as you have urged me. In this very wilderness shall your carcasses fall. Right, That's from Numbers a little bit earlier on. The observations of one scholar, the omission of particular discrete sites of burial has the effect of turning the wilderness in its entirety into a vast and terrible burying ground. So... Yeah. Yeah, she's not she's not ignored. We just don't know as much about her death. We just know how her death 
affected everybody else, but we don't necessarily know about how, how and why. So to close this out, again, I started off by telling you we wouldn't have any answers, but I wanted to bring this as a, kind of an interesting arc to this week's Parsha, that if we're going to start off by hearing about a ritual that even in the 21st century, we, we hold up as a very important ritual, right? The whole reason we started a Hever Kadisha with Ikar was because this is something that it feels very important to us. And the two, two of the three main characters of, you know, I would say 75% of our Torah die right after we get this ritual and yet we don't use it. So I just wanted to bring this as, as an interesting thing for you to think about um, while you're reading through this Parsha and AJ will get the last word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, most deaths in Torah, woman or man, don't really have yeah, there's no there's no real emotion, right? Yeah, that's what Alan just said. Yeah, Rachel, I guess, is the closest. Um but but yeah, it's a really good point that just, you know, death in general, but specifically women until Miriam, there isn't really necessarily a Correct. Correct. Hundred percent. Right. Right. What AJ just said, which is really important um, for those of you on Zoom to hear, is that they weren't really mourning Miriam at all. They were really mourning that which they lost when Miriam died, right? She was an asset to water that they needed, and then she died, and that water went away. So um, interesting that she was kind of a vessel for that which they needed, and the vessel went away. So Shabbat Shalom. I hope this is somewhat somewhat interesting and, and a thing that you can think about as we're as we're living in Parshat Chukat a week, um, and also to just recognize. I was telling Jackie I put this text together um, after Jackie's father passed away without really thinking that I had put it together in that in that context. But it is interesting to to live in a community where death is coming and death is going. Obviously, it's a very major part of our community. And the ways in which we deal with, with the death rituals, right? Some of us are very involved in the Hever Kadisha parts of things. Some of us are just involved in recognizing how people when they die are leaving things behind that we have to then either pick up in a very fond way or pick up in a way that is harder for us to be without or when it comes to Aaron who are sitting around and we're really mourning them for a very very long time so as a community we go kind of through all three of these different experiences